6-3 lead. Yeah, and all of a sudden it gets you thinking about just adding on whenever you have the opportunity. How about Bonifacio with a triple to get things going in that eighth inning? Omar Infante got a pitch in his eyes. He smoked it into left field for an RBI single. The Marlins weren't over. Logan Morrison had good at-bats every time up. That time found the hole to chase Infante over to third. Biggest hit of that inning. Off the left-hander, Greg Dobbs with a two-base hit into the right field corner, driving in two runs, and that made it a 6-3 to three lead at that time. So that was good to see in that top half, in the bottom half of the eighth inning. Edward Mejica gave up the two-run homer. Ciszek finished the game, and that turns the page to game two. Here are the starters for game two. Our Coventry Healthcare of Florida starters. You've got Florida native Bronson Arroyo, Florida native Chris Volstad. Kind of interesting, Bronson Arroyo has made seven starts. He's appeared in ten games against the Marlins, and he's 0-3. He's not beaten the Marlins. Chris Volstad, on the other hand, 1-1 one one in his career against the uh, Cincinnati Reds. Chris had seven strikeouts in his last outing, but the long ball has hurt him this year a little bit. So there's your matchup. You've got uh, Florida native squaring off, and remember... This is our big new ballpark show. Frank Fort from the new ballpark. Reds and Marlins, too. concourse beyond left field. Now come next season, our Fox Sports Florida pregame studio will be here for our Marlins Live pregame show. And right below me, there's about 400 seats. They overlook the Marlins bullpen and the pool area. And it'll be great seats to have if you're looking to catch a Mike Stanton or Gabby Sanchez home run ball next season. As far as the playing surface, the drainage system will start to be installed in October, and the actual turf will go down in January in preparation for the 2012 season. Now let's get back to Sun Life Stadium. All right, thank you, Frank. Updates from Frank Fort throughout the night. Special guests, Claude Delorme, David Sampson, Larry Beinfest will be by. Here's a little sneak peek at what we'll see tonight. Oh, man, the roof finish. Foul pole up. Look at the big video screen out in center field. It looks like almost every seat is installed. Look at that nice look. Tommy, there's our booth. How cool is that? There's the Marlins clubhouse. Wow, that looks uh, that looks sweet. So we got Reds and Marlins and a lot of new ballpark stuff. So hang in there, kids. Marlins won the first. They try for the sweep next.
Jim, where you been? We've been here all, well, not all day. We started at 4 o'clock. The Florida Marlins and the Cincinnati Reds have played game one of a doubleheader. This would be game two. Marlins won the first game 6-5. Warren Henry brings you the batting lineup for the Reds of Cincinnati. Brandon Phillips at second. Fred Lewis, his first start of the series. Joey Votto's at first. Jay Bruce is in right. Miguel Cairo, the versatile one at third. Drew Stubbs, the fast one in center. Brian Hannigan will do the catching. Paul Yanish at short. And Bronson Arroyo will hit ninth. And Jack McKeon, who was ejected from the first game, and I'm telling you, Tommy, Jack is such a creature of habit. He plays the hot <laughs> hand. I say he gets run in the second inning. We'll just have to see. <laughs> Here is Phillips now. And Brandon Phillips takes inside from Chris Volstead. Important start for Volstead. You can see his last three starts have not been good ones. And Phillips takes in Angel Hernandez calling balls and strikes. Well, Chris has been bothered by that home run ball. He's given up 20. Gave up uh, one to the big right-hander Kyle Blanks in his start in San Diego. Kind of an interesting start because I thought he had good stuff. And it's it's not always about stuff up here. It's about location. He had seven strikeouts. That tells you the stuff was there, but he gave up four runs and six hits in his five innings. Phillips a one for four days so far. And Volstad is missing up, and that's never a good sign for Chris. With that sinker, he likes to live down around the knees. That one's out of play. The count full at three and two. Yeah, guy who lives by that sinker has to think knees down. Little looper in the right field and Phillips is aboard with a base hit. Brandon Phillips a lead off single. Here's the Marlins defensively. Now Warren Henry brings it to defense with uh, Morrison, Peterson, and Stanton in the outfield. Dobson, Bonifacio, and Fonte. Gabby gets the start in game two. And Brett Hayes will handle Chris Volstead, who made a good pitch to Brandon Phillips, but he just muscled it into right field. For Phillips, uh, an eight-game hitting streak now. A little different look with Fred Lewis. Phillips a threat to run. And Volstead misses outside to Lewis. Former San Francisco Giant. Lewis taking a, a long look down at third base coach Mark Berry. Phillips is running. Broken bat and it squirts through the infield and Phillips is going to get to third base. And Lomo overruns it. Here comes Phillips. He'll stop. Wow. That was close. Morrison tried to barehand it. Ran right by it. Phillips a big turn. And it's first and third and nobody out. Boy, I tell you, this is where you really have to regroup as a pitcher. Chris Volstead has made two good pitches. The bloop by Phillips. He just saws off Lewis on a hit and run. But because it was a hit and run, Phillips was able to go first to third. I and with nobody out, he made the right decision. Yeah, I think he saw Mark Berry with his two hands up saying, not so fast. Especially with Votto and Bruce coming up. Yeah, here is Votto. And he smacks one into center field. That's a base hit. Phillips will score. Lewis is on his way to third. And this has not started well for Chris Volstad. Three hitters, three hits, one run. At the corners again, and here comes Bruce. Well, we've talked about uh, with a lot of the Marlins starters, the first inning problems. For Chris, that's the 17th run now in his 23rd start that he's allowed in the first inning. Hitters are hitting over 330 against him in the first inning. Randy St. Clair to the mound. Along with John Buck.
course, this is part of a doubleheader because of impending rain tomorrow. All your cooling brings you tonight's weather. It's dry. There, those are the uh, coordinates for Irene if you want to follow the cone of whatever they call it. 87 degrees, 67% humidity. The cone of probability. Thank you. Well, you've got the app on your uh, iPhone, so. <laughs> Hopefully it's the cone of probability and not the cone of inevitability. Right now it's the cone of singles for the Reds. They have three consecutive. Bruce stands up there and he takes a strike. Tough day for Bruce. He was 0 for 4 in the first game with three strikeouts. Reds at the corners, nobody out. That's a fair ball, and down the line it goes. Scoring is Lewis. Votto to third. Picked up by Stanton. Four consecutive hits. And here come the Reds. Now, in contrast to the first two batters, those balls weren't hit well. The next two batters, Votto and Bruce, have stung pitches. The two seamer came back middle of the plate, and Bruce just was able to scorch it past Gabby Sanchez. Jay Bruce Rich now with 84 RBIs on the year. One oh. Breaking ball for a strike to Miguel Cairo. Cairo, Major League veteran, has played in a lot of places, in a lot of positions. He fouls that one back. Tremendously valuable player to have. Again, uh, he's a veteran, knows uh, his approach, what he needs to do. You mentioned all the positions. He's 37. Venezuelan, resides in Safety Harbor, Florida. A little soft one. Infante freezes wherever they got a runner hung up. Gabby running towards the runner at third, and he will tag Votto out. That's a heck of a play by Omar Infante. Infante was doing two things. He was watching the ball, and he was watching the runner at third who didn't budge. The problem for the Reds is Bruce ran Votto off of third. And watch how Infante barehands this ball. As he's watching the runners, he knows where both of them are. He gets the out at first base, and then a heads-up play by Gabby to just chase the runner back. Joey Votto has no chance. And that's a heads-up play, and that's a big two outs there for Chris Volstead. Now Volstead has to make it pay off by getting Drew Stubbs. And again, another good pitch because he saw it off Cairo. That's why the runner at third base froze. That's why Votto froze because he wasn't sure if it was a ground ball or a line drive. It was in between. Well, one breaking ball is just off the plate. So it's a 4 3 double play, but you rarely see that finish between home and third base. There's the runner at second, Jay Bruce. He, he takes off, has his head down, and then he realizes that Votto's not going into score. And you see what Mark Berry does. Berry goes, okay, just get here to third and stay put. Holstead misses in. Three and one. That splits the plate.
3 2. Right down the middle. Stubb strikes out. So the damage is limited to just the two runs. A 2 0 start for Cincinnati. Welcome back. It's our big new ballpark show. We got special guests, more Frank Fort coming from the new ballpark. But first, this message brought to you by Warren Henry. Emilio Bonifacio will actually be starting at shortstop. Omar Infante is at second base. Logan Morrison at left. Mike Stanton in right. Greg Dobbs at third. Gabby Sanchez at first. Brian Peterson in center. Brett Hayes will hit eighth, and Chris Volstead hits ninth. Here is Bonifacio against Bronson Arroyo with that stylus leg kick, and he drops in a breaking ball. Born in Key West, raised in Florida. Arroyo has been durable, whether it's for Boston or Cincinnati. Or even Pittsburgh. Or even Pittsburgh, you're right. That's where he started. He was durable early in the season, and it, it really knocked a lot out of him, and it's, it's why his numbers are the way they are. 528 ERA, unlike Bronson Arroyo numbers, he had uh, mono, and he he actually pitched and got through things and made his starts, but wasn't as strong as he as he could be. Well, he's, he's had 15 or more wins the last three years. Bonifacio uh, triple in the big three-run eighth for the Marlins in the first game, and Arroyo misses up. Two and two. The Reds got two off Chris Volstead. The Marlins trying to answer right back. Bonifacio, a, a nice series going. Three for seven. Remember, he homered last night. Tripled today. Rolls that one out to Yanish. Who throws low. And it's dug out by Joey Votto. Nice to have a guy like Votto around to clean up your mess. Yeah, he's, uh, he does a nice job over there at first base. Pretty solid right side between uh, Phillips and Bottom. Here's Omar Infante. His hit the big one. One of the big ones in the eighth, the one that gave the Marlins the lead, and he drives one to left field. Hits it pretty well. And back there is Lewis to make the catch. Yeah, the Reds defensively. Check in on uh, Cincinnati. Warren Henry brings you the defense with Lewis, Stubbs, and Bruce. Pretty good speed in the outfield. Miguel Cairo starting at third. Yanish and Phillips up the middle. Joey Votto at first. Ryan Hannigan. We didn't see him in the first game. He's behind the plate. And all of that is brought to you by Warren Henry. Nice to have Logan Morrison back. And he announced his return with a home run. Well over the wall and right into that tunnel where Yonder Alonso went last night. 
Morrison scorched the ball twice for outs and then rolled the ground ball single into right. So he was two for four with an RBI in the first game and he takes a whack at that one. It's 0 and 2. That's a nice way to make your return, isn't it? Yeah, got a little fastball, moved across the plate, and another good swing. And as you said, Rich, he had good swings all four ABs. See how Hannigan set up inside. You know, some pitchers like that, some pitchers don't. You're not going to see 90 on the radar gun with Bronson Royal. Royal put it right on the glove of Hannigan there. You're going to see a lot of good control. That fastball 88, 89. He'll throw fastballs 85, 86. One, two is outside. Change up boy Morrison just laid off of that. It's a tough pitch to take. Yeah, back to back change ups. Well, let's see what he gets three and two. Let's see if he triples up on the change up. Now breaking ball and he gets Morrison to send it out to center field. Stubbs is there. He makes the catch. Bronson Arroyo with a one, two, three first. This new facility provides fans the opportunity to explore an actual ballpark suite. See all the new amenities, experience a 3D view from any seat in the ballpark. 1-877-411-2012. Make an appointment or go to marlins.com slash new ballparks. And if you're interested in the new ballpark, this is the place to be tonight. We have three guests that will talk about the ballpark. Claude Delorme, David Sampson, Larry Beinfest, though Larry will... Probably touch on the ballpark, and we have plenty of baseball questions for Larry. Yeah, I think we'll we'll get some of the baseball questions to Larry. Ryan Hannigan takes down low, and Frank Fort, who's already filed his first report from down there, is uh, on deck. Frank will be taking us all around the ballpark tonight. Hannigan takes a strike from Chris Volstad. Chris gave up two runs in the first. Yanish and Arroyo also coming up for Cincinnati. Up the middle, Infante is there. And Omar throws him out. 
There's an out. Here comes Giannis. Here comes our Toyota trend. Johnny B. Baker. The defending central champs are a season high 13 and a half games out of first place. And that's uh, you know, that's coming in. The Reds and actually won eight of their last 12. There you go. St. Louis 10 back. Back to Volstad and it gets under his glove. Infante can't make the play. And Janish is aboard. Anibal Sanchez, Ricky Nolasco have had opportunities to make plays. That was probably the easiest of all of those. And big innings ensued after that. Once it got by Chris Bolstad, it's a base hit for Janish, or might be an error. Yep, E1. And should be. So Arroyo is going to try to bunt, drops it down, Dobbs picks it up, and gets the out at first. So the Reds set up Brandon Phillips now in an RBI spot with Janish occupying second. You were talking about the uh, the Reds and uh, their position right now in the standings. They saw their uh, president of baseball ops and general manager Walt Jockety last night. So he's in town, certainly checking on things. Walt Jockety, one of the more respected uh, executives in baseball. He had a great run with Sandy Alderson in Oakland. Then was the general manager of the world champion St. Louis Cardinals. Brandon Phillips now who singled back in the first. It's a ground ball to short. That's Bonifacio out there in the second game and he throws out Phillips and Volstad avoids a big hit. Moving forward by AT&T, by Chankers, Little Place, Big Taste, and by All Year Cooling, today's comfort, yesterday's prices. Bronson Royals got a 2-0 lead. They're in the bottom of the second inning, Mike Stanton, Greg Dobbs, and Gabby Sanchez coming up. Doubleheader baseball, Marlins won the first, 6-5. In a game in which it took two to close in the ninth. No Leo Nunez today. Jack McKeon, after last night's blow up, said Nunez would not close either game. He stuck to his guns. Edward Mojica tried, gave up a two run homer to Todd Frazier in the ninth. Steve Ciszek came in and got the final out for the save. And, uh, and did it nifty. Ciszek came in and got Brandon Phillips. 
that Dave Sapel got him right before Joey Votto too. Stanton takes down low. Three slow curveballs. He's seen all out of the strike zone from Arroyo. So does he dare throw him a fastball? If he does, he'll try to crowd him with it. Oh, that was a nice pitch to hit, but sometimes, even if he had the green light, especially a young hitter, might not feel that comfortable. He won't see that pitch again, though. See what he gets three and two. Off speed pitch, foul back and out of play. Let's scout Bronson Arroyo, the 34 uh, year old veteran. Lots of strikes. He's a strike thrower. Deception in that delivery with that leg kick. Adds and subtracts. Takes a little bit off. Fastball brought to you by Coventry Healthcare. Ground ball in the hole. That's going to be a base hit for Stan. So Mike is aboard. Yanish got a glove on it. And the Marlins have their first hit. Here comes Greg Dobbs. It's this ball in the hole. Mike hits those balls with that tremendous top spin. Amazing that Yanish even got a glove on it, but it had no play once it trickled away from him. Dobbs had an enormous hit for the Marlins in their three run eighth. First game of this doubleheader, two run double that stretched the lead to 6 3. As it turns out, they needed both of those runs after Mujica served up a two run homer to Todd Frazier. Well, it's been a solid year. His average has dropped off a little bit, but still 16 doubles on the year for Greg Dobbs. And five home runs. Ball in the strike. And it would be interesting to, to talk to Dobbs and find out when was the last time he started both games of a doubleheader. I would venture to say in his Seattle days, maybe. Why well, you know doubleheaders are so rare in the big league level. Phillips, Yanish, Vado. And that spells two. That ball was struck sharply when you hit a sharp ground ball to a gold glover it usually turns into that uh, easy double play that we just saw. This copyrighted telecast is presented by the authority of the Florida Marlins may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Marlins. The seminar is the verb, right? The translation from your iPad app. Yeah, we had the, uh, the Spanish. High pop. It's going to bring Bruce in. Phillips is there as well. It's Brandon Phillips, the Gold Glover, who makes the catch. Marlins get a hit, but runs in a row right now, shooting down.
for the Marlins, 2 nothing. Chris Volstead gets Fred Lewis, Joey Votto, Jay Bruce. And here is Fred Lewis. Now let's see if uh, Chris Volstead can come back the way he did in the second inning and uh, make the same kind of pitches. Frank Fort's next report. The Fort report is coming next half inning. So Frank will be filing from Dateline, new ballpark. This just in. Rich and Tommy's booth is huge and plush. Although Tommy's request of the massage table and scented candles has yet to be installed. Candles, I think we can get. But. <laughs> the blender is a good idea. I like that one. The blender, the uh, the mini bar, <laughs> the disco lights. <laughs> Every time the Marlins hit a home run, yeah, the, the disco, disco lights ball. go off yeah. in the home TV booth. <laughs> the disco ball. That's not a bad idea now that I think of it. That one's fouled out of play. <laughs> Fred Lewis getting the start for Dusty Baker in left field. He had a broken bat single on a hit and run. He got sawed off and dribbled one into left field. I mean, when you think about it, Harry Carey used to sing to take me out the ball game. Uh, Jerry Coleman had hang a star on that good play with we could have disco lights. <laughs> We just saw Jerry Coleman in San Diego. He got one of the largest ovations in the Trevor Hoffman ceremony. The the, the guy I think that um, got maybe the loudest that surprised a lot of people, Steve Finley. Yes. Inside corner, Volstead comes back and gets Lewis. That's a nice pitch. If there's an octogenarian that has more energy than Jerry Coleman, I want to see him. What? Jack McKee. They're on the same same class. Yeah. Those two guys. Well, Amazing. But Jerry's even older. Jerry's 87. Well, Jack fired Jerry. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. <he did. laughs> Here's Votto. Jerry managed the uh, Padres for one year. Jack fired him. Came out of the uh, booth. He'd been uh, their radio announcer and then went back to the booth. Sort Jack like fired Larry Bowen, too. Yes, he did. Jack had to be talked into managing the ball club at the end of his tenure as the GM manager. Jim Lexus presents leaders of the game. Joey Votto's near the top of just about everything. Batting average as well, 325. Jam Lexus price made us number one. Click jamlexus.com to find out how. As Tommy pointed out, he is on top in on base percentage. And he hits a ball to left field deep. He homered there in the first game, and that ball is. Gone. He did it again. Opposite field, Joey Votto, his second of the day, his 24th of the season. Boy, this guy's got some amazing power. Watch the great camera work by Glenn out in left field. Still with it. Still with it. Oh, Glenn. <laughs> Glenn, are you okay? Yep, he's fine. All Good right, work. thumbs up from Glenn. That's a great shot. That's, you know, they talk about infielders keeping the ball in front of you, outfielders knock it down, cameramen, camera people, keep the shot. No matter what, keep the shot. Don't take your eye off the ball. Stay focused. Focus, Tom. <laughs> Watch this direct hit. Whoa. Did it hit the lens? We saw. We lost one in San Diego, but apparently the lens held on that one. What are those things worth? Now look at that. Glenn's not even wearing a helmet. Glenn's been to the gym. Nice work, Glenn. It's a gun show going on there, Tommy. There's <laughs> <laughs> a one, too. <laughs> oh, look out. That was scorched. Jay Bruce turning on it.
two pitch runs outside. Joey Votto twice today. Once in the first. Once here in the second. Both to left field. Everybody talks about the uh, small ballpark, a very hitter friendly ballpark, great American ballpark in Cincinnati. But uh, Joey Votto has shown us that it doesn't matter uh, with the way he's hit the ball the opposite field two times here. Votto homering off Vasquez in the first game. There's a liner to Bonifacio. And then homering off of Volstad and Glenn here in the second game. Here's Miguel Cairo. Cairo takes a breaking ball for a strike. So the Reds have three early runs against Volstad. Bronson Arroyo looks sharp tonight. Both teams headed out of town as soon as this one is over. Peterson Morrison calls for it and Lomo is there and makes the catch Joey Votto opposite fields again Go. much foul territory between here and either dugout. As far as dimensions are concerned, 335 down the line in right field, shorter than Sun Life Stadium. Center field will also be closer to home plate at 420 feet. But now down the left field line, those right-handed hitters have to hit it further. 344 feet down the line, that's 14 feet longer than it is at Sun Life Stadium. And not much room between the foul line and the stands as you get towards those foul poles, only about nine feet of room in that area. Thank you, Frank. Brian Peterson hit by that pitch. You know, the cool thing about that shot, Tommy, as we get back to our Cleveland Clinic third inning, is that little wood square with the orange fencing around it, that's where home plate goes. That has been sitting there for the last year and a half while they have built the ballpark around it. And then there'll be the final touch it will be the placing of home plate. Yeah, they'll take that yeah. fence off and, and voila, there's home plate. So that was there when when you and I were down there in the spring when a number of the Marlins players took batting practice. Yes. Brett Hayes takes a breaking ball for a strike. Brian Peterson hit by a pitch. He's at first. The Marlins try to put a dent in Bronson Arroyo's night. Arroyo's been sharp. An infield single erased by a double play ball. And he's a guy that will sink it on you. He's a guy that uh, I mean you're not uncomfortable up there against. But uh, as I said in the scouting report he adds and subtracts so he just keeps you off balance enough. That's down low.
Two one pitch coming to Hayes. Too much time for Hayes. You got good speed with Peterson at first. He's the kind of guy, Rich, that as a hitter, you you get the count in your favor, which is always your goal, but then you're still not going to get a, a really good pitch to hit. To left center, Lewis comes racing on, and he makes the catch. It's almost here. The new Marlins ballpark, state-of-the-art venue unlike any other, with a retractable roof for air-conditioned comfort all overlooking downtown Miami. The new Marlins ballpark is opening next spring. Catch the excitement. Call 1-877-411-2012 or go to marlins.com. Marlins.com slash new ballpark. Volstead squares, drops down the bunt. Arroyo pounces, goes to second, gets an out there. The relay to first. That would be a double play. And the bunt blows up in the Marlins' faces. Two double plays rolled by Arroyo. Three innings in the books. Three nothing Reds. on top Dusty Baker looking out and pondering this AT&T trivia question which red has the most hits all time at Sun Life Stadium mm. it was David Concepcion that had the most hits at Riverfront but that was more back in the 70s so you have to uh, you have to fast forward a little bit to to 90s Reds players I, I got a great name I don't even know if it's the answer. I have no idea. Chris Sabo. <laughs> Chris Sabo, the the guy that many people felt looked like Spuds McKenzie. Hard nosed player, third base. Yep. You know, I think his. I, I, it's a, I, I got another good guess. Well, I, but the, remember, Sabo played on that uh, ninety. On the world championship team. Yeah, he was a little before. A little before 93. How about Sean Casey? Hmm. Oh, getting buzzed. Yeah, I, I like that guess. I knew you did. True Stubbs gets sawed off. Better hurry. Oh, man. Infante kicks wow. it. Got him. What a play. Nasty English. No problem. He barehands it and throws out one of the fastest runners the Reds have. Totally jammed his stubs. Watch this barehand play. And Fonte's played the last couple of innings without a glove. Made a couple of great barehanded stabs. Keep in mind, got two of the best fielding second basemen on the field in this series in Brandon Phillips and Omar Infante. Man, we've seen stubs twice beat out infield hits in this series. And so Infante makes a terrific play. And here is Ryan Hannigan. Holstead misses away with a fastball.
Both snap misses away, and the count is 2-0. and oh. Made some nice defensive plays tonight. It was a great double play started by Bronson Arroyo last inning. Yeah, on the butt by Volstead. Chris gets a strike. Two and one to Hannigan. Hannigan did not like that call. One catcher to an umpire. Hannigan saying, wait a minute, that's a that's a high strike. I thought that wasn't called anymore, and, and it it was just barely a strike. A strike's a strike. I mean, it's either a strike or it's not. A lot of umpires don't call that though. That one misses away. Now Volstead's thinking to himself, hey, I'd rather have that one. You'll see more umpires call the one that's on the line at the bottom of the zone than that's on the line at the top of the zone. Not an easy job. Ball's moving 95, 96 miles an hour. It's breaking sharply. It's running in. It's running out. They're, they're behind the plate making split second decisions. We're up here looking at two and three replays. Watch this play. That's almost as good as the play by the ball boy. It's a nice grab in the first game. What a feeling. Brought your glove to the game and then got a foul ball. Now there's the guy. Did he switch over? No, he's, he's still over there. This is his catch. And our crack staff has done a little bit of research on him, Tommy. That is Oscar Tellez, who is a former Marlins RBI All-Star. Marlins participated in reviving baseball in the inner city. And Oscar was an All-Star. And you can see why. Yeah. Here's why he was an All-Star. Oh. Great extension, great timing. Oh, it's one of the best ball boy catches of the year. Oscar made a diving attempt at a, at a ball later in, in the game. Knocked it down, but he was unable to make the play. Yeah, it was ruled a base hit. Yeah, so what? I like that. Our crack staff did that research. Fly ball on a broken bat. We'll have more Frank Fort reports. The Fort report. Frank has already been to home plate. He's been up in uh, left field. The pregame uh, position. We've been told uh, Frank's going to give us a look at the uh, nighttime skyline from nice out the uh, left side area. He'll be in the clubhouse at the left field area. Here's a 1 1. Olstad misses. He's two and one on Yanish. You don't have to worry about Hannigan over there at first base. He, he has about a step, maybe step and a half lead. Ah, he's on the move. Hit and run. Hit and run. Bonifacio thought about it and gets the out at first. The Dusty Baker knows that, so he sent the slower runner, put a little pressure on Yanish, the hitter, to make contact. <laughs> All right, let's answer some trivia. I'll go Joey Votto. I'm going to go Sean Casey. Barry Larkin. You, you used uh, Barry Larkin as an answer in uh, one of your other answers. Yeah, I, I thought he was uh, Riverfront. All right, Sean Casey was second. Another, another nice left-handed hitter was third, Hal Morris. Remember Hal Morris? Reggie Sanders. When did they balance the or unbalance the schedule? And Junior, Junior Griffey, fifth on that list. When did they unbalance the schedule in the National League? When interleague play came in. No, so that was uh, 94, right? Yeah.
one fouled out of play. It's one and two. Great opportunity here for Chris to get out of this situation with Arroyo up there. Arroyo's helped himself twice tonight. Dropped down a sack bunt in the second. And then started that double play last in. Got a long list of questions for David Sampson. He'll be by next half inning. Then we've got Claude Delorme coming on. Then we'll finish the night with Larry Beinfest. We'll see more Frank Fort. Interleague play was introduced in 97, according to the crack staff. That's right, 94 was the strike year. 95 first year of the wild card. But the uh, importance of the. Uh, no, I think the wild card came in with the uh, with interleague play, didn't it? No, because in I know the Marlins were the first wild card team to win a World Series in 95. Well, if they, which was 97, right? But in 95, I remember being a resident of the Northwest, following the Seattle Mariners. They were trying to make a run at the wild card and ended up winning the division in a one-game playoff. So I think 95 was uh, first year wild card. Can I get a bell at least on that? Give, give Rich a bell on 95. Swing and a miss. Good job. Can't believe I didn't get a bell on that. Oh, the golf clap is nice too. Florida lighting the way to better health. All right, this telecast dedicated to the new ballpark. We've seen Frank Fort's reports. And uh, Frank has already been up in the left field. He's been down at home plate. David Sampson, Marlins president, joins us now. We have a, a list of questions from last night to ask you about the new ballpark. But we'll start with one of ours. What is the completion percentage at right now? Uh, we're over 80 percent. There's about seven months to go, so uh, I'd call us exactly at 80 ah, percent, which is a, a good number, but not as good as 100. I guess the the question that came with the uh, with the hurricane scare, so to speak, and it's thankfully staying out east, is when the New Orleans ballpark is done, what wind speed will it withstand? What uh, type of hurricane proof is it? Well, it's all the glass is hurricane proof. Everything's built to code. And it's basically the code is well is over 100 miles an hour. So everything is good. There is actually a protocol for the roof when a hurricane comes. Believe it or not, you have to leave the roof open about 12 feet during a hurricane for wind pressure and wind stabilization. It was explained to me by Max Mayfield, and it was quite confusing. But who would I, know? Who would, would know? know? Yeah. And what I took from it was the 12 feet part. That I can figure out. That's not over my my head. I took a meteorology class in college at Wisconsin, and so it brought me right back into it. But uh, it's going to be able to withstand just about anything. But we certainly hope nothing comes. 
Wi-Fi. Last night we saw a lot of fans with iPads here last night, and some asked, will there be Wi-Fi available to fans in the new ballpark? So the answer is yes. Okay. And one of the uh, email emails I got on d.samson at marlins.com, which is an email I use to get suggestions about the ballpark and movie questions, etc., there was a, a guy who wanted to make sure there was going to be Wi-Fi in the bathrooms. And uh, that's how much people want to be connected. It's The world has changed. You want to be connected at all times. We will be fully Wi-Fi'd everywhere in the ballpark. So you will be able to get messages to you. We'll be able to make sure we're in contact with deals throughout the ball game. All sorts of good stuff. Rich, I want to go to one of the ones that was asked uh, last night. Okay. I thought it was an interesting one. The uh, Here on the, on the walls, we have the, the Craig Council picture. We have, uh, of course, the championship years. Will those be, or how will they be displayed in the new ballpark? Well, that outfield wall sign actually will disappear because uh, in the new ballpark, the outfield wall is quite different, and most of it is actually see-through because the bullpens get to see through the outfield wall. Okay. There's different party areas that get to see through the outfield wall, including the pool area called the playa. So it's not as much outfield wall signage space. So all of those signs that you see out there are going to be retired. Auctioned I would ask off. the Dolphins if they want to use them. They could them. be auctioned off for the community foundation. They could, but how do you exactly deliver them? I guess we'd have to get some sort of trailer, well, whoever, the ones with the flags Whoever on. wins the auction comes and gets it. <laughs> COD? Yeah. Well, you had some fans last night that said they want that Craig Council pad or panel in their backyard. So they're probably willing to pay for it. Infante drills that one into center field. Well, I'll tell you what. On closing day, which is Wednesday, September 28th. 28th. Wednesday the 28th when we do closing day. We're doing a lot of great ceremonies. It's a 4-10 game. We're bringing in a lot of old alumni. We're going to go through the greatest moments in Marlins history and announce the all-time Marlins team. Maybe we'll add taking down the outfield wall padding and <laughs> dealing with it to go. proceeds to benefit the uh, community foundation. Very, Sounds good. Very I'm on nice. that right now. Okay. All right, I got to go do that. Do you want me to stay? <laughs> no, hold on. We have okay. a few more questions. <laughs> Logan Morrison stands in. Morrison flied to center in the first. Two hits in the first game. Morrison homering in his first at bat back. And Lomo drives that ball to left center. Hit it pretty well, but Stubbs is there and makes the catch. We had a lot of food questions. Shake Shack has become a popular spot at City Field and at Nationals Park. Any chance there's a Shake Shack in the Marlins new ballpark? No, there's not a Shake Shack, but there's a lot of things that are unique to Miami. So I know there's a Shake Shack up east, and there's even a Shake Shack down in South Beach. But when I think of Miami food, I sort of have a different view of it than, than, uh, than a Shake Shack, which is good. I don't necessarily love standing on line for as long as it takes to get it. But I will tell you that uh, the food is going to be better than you Can you, you give us any thought. examples? Uh, we haven't announced anything yet, okay. but the Taste of Miami in, in left field right near the bar area is going to have some very interesting Miami, uniquely Miami sandwiches and Miami-type food. And throughout the ballpark, different concession stands, whether they're Cuban or Mexican or just any kind you can think of. It's going to be very original food. We've actually begun the process of putting menus together. That's how, that's how late in the process we are. This last 20% of the ballpark includes things like getting the menus ready. Which is uh, important to us. We love the food stuff. Mike Stanton hits a high pop-up right field. Bruce comes charging on. Phillips is out, and it's Bruce who makes the catch. David, can you hang in for another half inning? Absolutely. The list is long. More questions to ask. 3 nothing, Reds.
Ballpark. David Sampson has joined us tonight. Now the playing surface. A lot of questions last night, David. Number one, the grounds crew. We know that the Marlins have the best grounds crew in baseball. Will they be making their way down to Miami? <laughs> we certainly have the busiest grounds crew, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, we will have a grounds crew in Miami, but it will be quite a bit smaller because the tarp going on and off the field during the course of a game is not going to happen. You actually just need one person to press a button to close a roof instead of 20 people to... Uh, Put a tarp on. Will you still have a tarp just in case? Yes, because we're growing grass and so the roof is open during the day. So for squalls that happen during the day or for just rainstorms, the tarp would go on. Do you know the type of grass? Yeah, it's a type of grass that uh, it's similar to what they have in Houston. We grew a bunch of it uh, in the parking lot here actually to see how it would react. Uh, and we're going to the sod field in Tampa just this week to check on its progress because it's going to start being put down in January. Uh, so it's like a Bermuda grass. It's going to be good. We get to grow it a little bit longer because there's no football. There's no other sports. So all in all, it's, uh, it's going to be much better. There's one out. Brandon Phillips bouncing out. Fred Lewis comes up. Uh, uniform. Fans last night wanted to know, will the Marlins wear at home? Will it say Marlins? On the road, will it say Miami? Uh, I know you guys are not unveiling colors, logo, and all that until November 11th. But what about uh, what will it say on the front of the uniform? Look for that November 11th. <laughs> you will see it all. Infante makes a play. Time now for the uh, Keep Your Red Spotlight brought to you by Just Furman Mustache and Beard. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joey Votto to the show. Second time today he's hit an opposite field homer. Just as Joey Votto... Hit that one right off the lens. You two can keep your edge with just for men, mustache, and beard. Rich, Joey Votto this year has hit 12 home runs to center, six to left, and six to right. It's quite a spread chart. It's a great spread chart. Impressive. No, but we'll announce that November 11th is a, is a big day because we're going to show everyone the uniforms and the caps and the new logo and the new colors. So look for that. We'll have announcements coming up on where it's going to be because uh, it may be at a very, very cool I'm place. My next Valley. question is where are the announcements going to take place? It's going to take have to place wait in a cool place, Tommy. Okay. In the center field home run water park. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's actually going to be a sculpture, that. It looks like a water tank, but it's actually a sculpture. Very nice. All right, David, thank you. Thanks, David. You're the first guest. Claude Delorme is up next. He's on deck. You set the bar. You better have a longer inning for him. That's all I can <laughs> Look say. Look at that skyline. <laughs>
from the new ballpark. It's almost like the Colbert Report. Without the sarcasm. <laughs> Arroyo misses up. To Greg Dobbs. Frank is never sarcastic. Dobbs. Very informative. Gabby Sanchez and Brian Peterson. Frank will be with us, uh, Rich, in uh, Philadelphia, New York. Tell Frank to pack his rain gear. <laughs> Marlins right now, a two hit shutout being spun by Bronson Arroyo. After Dobbs, you got Gabby Sanchez. It was an infield single by Mike Stanton in the second, and Fonte's line drive single in the fourth. And it's two and one to Dobbs. Marlins won the opener today, six to five. The Leo Coaster was out of commission, and Edward Mojica came in and tried to close it, gave up a two run homer, and had to be bailed out by Steve Ciszek. It's a big slow curveball that uh, Bronson Arroyo features. Arroyo's had 30 or more starts last six years. Dobbs to center, late start by Stubbs. Now he gets there and makes the catch. So an out here in the fifth. Before this season is up, and there's what, 12 more games left? You can take advantage of the new Marlins single game suite rentals, padded premium seats, flat screen TVs, air conditioning, access to club level amenities. It's the perfect choice for a big family, upscale client, or employee entertainment. 305 626 Saver, go to Marlins.com slash groups. Rich, I heard a name today in a uh, in a game, the uh, Seattle Cleveland game. Forgot that he was uh, back up in the big leagues. He was actually traded for Bronson Arroyo. Arroyo was acquired by the Reds from the Red Sox for Willie Mo Pena. And Willie Mo Pena was three for three today with a home run and four RBIs for the Seattle Mariners. Didn't he start the year in Arizona? He started the year he got called up. He was with Arizona. Teams, you think Willie Mopena? I haven't looked this up yet, and I'm about to. But if you were to venture a guess, how many teams has Willie Mopena appeared for, with in the big leagues? I'd say seven. Do I look under Pena or Mopena? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the 0-2. Gabby goes after a high fastball and fouls it back. Boston fans may want to uh, rework that deal. So Willie Mopena didn't work out with the Red Sox. No. And Arroyo's been durable yes. and very good. All right. Willie Mopena with the Reds. Boston. Nationals. Arizona. Seattle. Uh, just five. Now that's in the big leagues. If I pull up his minor league numbers, maybe there's another organization he might have appeared with. Yankees was originally in the Yankees organization. You know, the other and thing, Padres. <laughs> the other thing about a Royal, you mentioned uh, durable. As a major leaguer, and he's won 110 games. He's never been on the disabled list. Way back in his early years in the minor leagues with Pittsburgh, he spent some time on the DL. That's it. Eight different organizations. We forgot the Padres and the Yankees. He didn't get to the big leagues with those teams. It's a good battle that uh, these two are having Gabby Sanchez and Bronson Arroyo. What do you call that? Is that a hat? Is it a. It's like that old Star Trek. Uh, Episode The Trouble with Tribbles. Or a warm and fuzzy if you want. The one, two. Gabby swings and misses, and a Royal strikes him out. Yeah, we, for 
forgot to mention too when when Arroyo, of course, it ended the inning, so we didn't have a chance to. But Arroyo won a Gold Glove last year. So when they had Scott Rowland on the field and Arroyo out there, and Brandon Phillips we got a lot of gold. Yeah, when we were there in April, they had the ceremony and presented the three gold gloves, didn't they? In Cincy, yeah, I think they did. Was that before or after Johnny Gomes' bobblehead night? Before they traded Johnny Gomes? That one is outside. One ball, one strike to Peterson. He reached back in the third. He was hit by a pitch. Claude Delorme. Mr. New Ballpark will be coming by. I don't think uh, Claude Delorme knows yet that we have uh, given him a, a new, nickname. New title? Yeah, new title. Here's the one, too. He just goes after a high fastball, hits it to center. But this yard will hold it, and Stubbs will catch it. And Bronson Arroyo's cruising, throwing a two hit shutout. And Pat Delano, these guys are the head of the Hunt Moss construction project. Their imprint will be forever lasting on baseball fans here. That's got to be a neat thing to know that what you guys are building down in, in uh, Little Havana will be the home of the Marlins and a place that's going to bring a lot of joy and memory to everybody, Pat. Oh, it's so exciting. We can't wait for the wow factor of all the fans to come in and see it on opening day. What do you think of Sid's cowboy hat, by the way? You know, I don't think many people recognize him not being here with his cowboy hat. That's a cowboy hat slash construction hat, huh? That's correct. What is, uh, what's the latest on the project? And obviously, I'm sure you're breathing a sigh of relief with uh, the p potential that Hurricane Irene could have caused you. Very much so. It was a uh, tense uh, couple of days. It looks like we're in good shape. The project's in excellent shape, moving very well. Now, I was there about a week ago. Most of the seats are in now. Look, what's the next concentration for you? Is it the interior, the, the tile, and all those kind of things? The biggest key right now is just getting it watertight so that we can withstand all the storms that do come. So we're trying to get a roof on and get all the enclosure on right now. So well, you don't think of that, but because you have to leave the roof open a little bit, you're getting rain in there. How do you deal with it? Uh, it's it's uh, management, day-to-day -day laborers to clean up the water and move it around, but uh, it's, it's very manageable at this point. You got to pull down a number here, interestingly enough, a number made very famous in this very stadium, the number 13 Dan Marino War, but uh, a different sport. How neat is it to be part of this? Well, it's, it's awesome, and it's, it's so much of an honor, and that's his lucky number. So, you know what, that's going to go on his wall in his office. All right, good timing. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you very much. Perkins, Pat Delano, they are head of the construction project as we're focusing in on the new ballpark tonight.
Let's go back over to Rich and Tommy. All right, thank you. And uh, Craig, we're joined now by Claude Delorme. Claude, uh, his title was uh, what Vice President of Ballpark Development. But now that there's a new ballpark, we've renamed you Mr. New Ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> so we have Mr. Your, Marlin, we have Mr. New Ballpark. That's your official title. Okay, I'll retain that. I, how, how much time have you spent with that pair down yeah, there over guys, the last three years? Those guys are outstanding. Uh, you know, every day we, you know, we've been meeting uh, very early, talking about the Hurricane Irene uh, this week. So made a lot of decisions uh, as it related to uh, th the extent of the work and. Uh, the lockdown of the roof and so forth, but uh, it's a pleasure to work with guys that are that professional. We have a variety of questions for you. David answered some. One which uh, has come up a lot, the name of the new ballpark. How close are the Marlins to having a title sponsor or a, a name on the park? I could tell you where, the, you know, David's very focused on this. Uh, a great deal of his time is spent on the naming rights. And, uh, you know, getting a deal of this magnitude for this, uh, for an extended period, uh, where we're talking, uh, uh, you know, a deal of, of approximately 18 years. And before, before everything gets signed off by the parties and it has to go through a board, uh, but we, we feel we're very close. And uh, hopefully by the end of September, we'll be in a position to make a, a formal announcement. David said 80% complete right now. 78.5. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're Mr. New Ballpark, <laughs> so you would know. 78.5. And, and, and the uh, ever optimistic uh, David Sampson had it at 80%. Yeah, of see? course. David's <laughs> always a few percentage points, you know. He, he keeps the pressure on us. What, um, over the last, uh, because we've had Frank Fort filing reports tonight, over the last month or so, I know that as the building goes up, a few things pop up that surprise you. The view of downtown, the closeness of the seats to the field. What is evolved over the last month for you? You know, you're just starting to get in so many details. Uh, every week uh, you come in and you, you notice, uh, you know, when we, we, we put the tiles and all their concessions uh, on the promenade level uh, in, in just over a week, uh, and the impact it had on the concession stands, so significant as you're walking the promenade level. Uh, the presence, the strength of the uh, of those rooms uh, really picks up, and uh, I think people, you know, as you walk it, you, you notice there's so many details that uh, it's going to take uh, several visits for the fans to fully appreciate the building. And that, of course, is why the exhibition games, the two that have been announced with the Yankees, 25,000, 30,000, just to kind of get a feel of of fans flowing in and out of the ballpark, coming in and leaving. Yeah, Tom, uh, you, you know, we'd like to do, and we, we will definitely schedule other events as well leading up to the two Yankee games, but uh, we want to uh, start doing uh, some soft events probably uh, last week, uh, third or fourth week of February uh, in the Diamond Club, which is our mm -hmm. private uh, room right behind home plate uh, in our dugout clubs, and then eventually have a few uh, college games on the field uh, in March, uh, 5, 10, 15,000 people, and then build it up to the Yankees with 25 and 30 and then uh, be ready for the home opener that Wednesday on April 4th uh, with the full house. Do, uh, do you have the invites for Rich and I for the uh, Diamond Club event? The Diamond Club? For whatever reason, uh, <laughs> I think, uh, you know, I, I must have missed that one. You know? I don't know what happened there. I think That's Frank, right. Frank told me uh, you weren't invited for whatever reason. I don't know what happened. There. As long as you install the mini bar and the blender that we've uh, <laughs> asked for in the booth, we're happy. Yeah, no, you guys are going to be in great shape. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time with Frank on, uh, in the last few days, so uh, you know, I know he's... Uh, he's He's making sure we take care of you guys. I bet you did. Hey, there's Ryan Hannigan in a 3 0 Reds lead in the top of the six. Chris Volstad throws a strike. Here is a, a, a question about what time will the gates open? Um, many Marlin fans unhappy that they're unable to come in and see Mike Stanton take batting practice. If someone's going to come down early and grab something to eat around the ballpark, will they be able to come in and watch the Marlins take batting practice? Yeah, the gates uh, right now, in the, you know, typically the gates open an hour and a half before the game. Uh, in our first year, we're, we're still evaluating uh, an hour and a half versus two hours. So uh, it's going to give our fans ample time to visit the area. And we, we, we want to give access to the aquariums as well behind home plate. So uh, the families to take the kids to see it uh, before before the game starts. And we'll, uh, we'll certainly activate that area, even though the fans might not be located there. Uh, give them the opportunity to uh, to see the uh, these unique aquariums. Runner on the move, Hayes' throw, not in time. 
Miguel Cairo with the stolen base. So you guys might open the gates up to two hours early, so they might get to see not only the aquarium but also Mike Stan. Yeah, absolutely. Mike Mike is, is really impressive during batting practice. We we know what he does during games, and uh, during BP he just unloads. So it's. Uh, it's a treat for our fans to to be able to see that on a daily basis. He's becoming a legend around uh, around the league. Impressive, uh, impressive and consistent. So that's what you like to see for a 21 year old. Had a, a couple of questions about the link to tri rail. Will there be any tri rail baseball specials, like a shuttle back and forth? Yes, uh, we're working very closely with the county and uh, in terms of Culmer Station, which is a little bit less than a mile from the park, having a direct shuttle service. And uh, we'll know it goes to uh, the budgets are being submitted to, in September, and hopefully that gets approved and uh, we can formalize that. And we're also looking for direct uh, shuttle service from the, uh, the government center as well, directly to the park. and. Uh, Civic Center, which is right next to 12th Avenue, brings you directly to the ballpark as well. So, so people who are actually parked downtown could take that. Correct. To, yeah. Correct. Okay. Leave, leave their cars downtown mm -hmm. and then take the direct shuttle uh, to the ballpark. So those are all things that we're working presently with the county, and uh, we hope that uh, all this gets approved and uh, we can uh, we, we can formally announce it. Full count, two outs. Mr. New Ballpark, Claude Delorme <laughs> is with us. Here, I'll sneak in another question. The uh, a viewer last night on email Tuesday asked, Dolphins oftentimes have a, a ticket bus fare package from different locations in the Treasure Coast and Palm Beach County. Will the Marlins have a similar plan with the new ballpark? Yeah, it's, uh, it's funny you say that because uh, two days ago we were with uh, the Duffy's owner, and uh, that's one of the discussions that we uh, we were having the possibility of uh, doing that. And I know they've done that for uh, for football games, and uh, uh, we're evaluating that possibility for uh, certainly weekend games, uh, Rich, that we could perhaps uh, do that on certain uh, certain occasions. Mike Stan back to the track makes a nice running catch. Claude, can you stick around for another half minute? Absolutely. Outstanding. Marlins need some run. Oh, look at the skyline. Love it. Oh, not another one. Oh, wait a minute. Glenn manning the camera. <laughs> Look out. Ball off the lens. Glenn's okay. Gun show continues out there in left field. Our course like freeze cam. Good work. Look at Glenn. Peace, love, and baseball. Gotta like that. Chris Volstead may be done between innings in a 3 0 game. The Marlins need some runs. And so. John Buck, a little high five. You know, Chris is due up second, and and really, you think about the two runs he gave up in the first inning, a couple of uh, bloops, and then a couple of well hit balls, and he gave up that solo home run. After that, 
It's as good as we've seen Chris Volstead throw the ball in a while. The problem is, as you see Burke Badenhop warming up, Bronson Arroyo throwing a two hit shutout into the bottom of the sixth. Brett Hayes takes outside. Claude Delorme, Vice President of Ballpark Development, or Mr. New Ballpark, <laughs> joins us now. Um, all right, we've seen shots from the new ballpark. That downtown skyline just pops right off the screen when we see it. And um, I know when you guys, even when you close the glass, you get a, a clear shot of it. It's a spectacular view. Uh, you know, that you, you talk about us being amazed, uh, even though we work there and we spend so many hours there. But uh, when you're coming towards the ballpark from uh, Fifth Street and you see the view as you're coming in of the seats and, and when you're, you're behind home plate, you know, on the promenade level and you, you're seeing that view of all the buildings, it's, you tell people you're 12 blocks from downtown. And when you're sitting down, they can really get an appreciation uh, of what that is. It's, it's, it's really impressive and one of the uh, key signature pieces of the ballpark. Hayes, a ground ball, base hit in the left field. And the Marlins have their leadoff man aboard. Here's a look at the, the view. Look at that. Yeah, that's, you know, that's impressive. And, you know, around 830 at night, uh, once all the lights come down and people are, you know, they, that view is really coming in from either the legends level, which is our, or the club level here, or the promenade level, and that's really uh, the opening. And what you're seeing there, there's only four of the six panels that are open, and uh, so that's uh, two thirds of the size of the real opening that uh, the fans will experience so, in 2012. So whether the roof is closed or open, you're going to still have that nice view. Yeah, well, the. Tom, the, the one thing we have to uh, right now, when the roof is closed, the wall will be closed. We're, you know, we're still experiencing, experimenting with that, but uh, uh, right now we just can't permit heavy winds to come into the building and uh, the wind load pressure and whatnot. So, uh, the, the way we've been planning this all along is uh, the roof is closed, the wall will be closed. But uh, as Rich was saying, even when the roof is the wall is closed, the view of downtown mm -hmm. is, is impressive. We had a question last night about.
It starts a day early, actually. Headed out tonight, Philadelphia, Friday through Sunday. And then New York City for a five-game series against the Mets. Hope you're with us. All games on Fox Sports Florida. All games in high definition. So our new ballpark edition tonight. We've been down to the new ballpark. David Sampson has joined us. Claude Delorme, Mr. New Ballpark himself. And the Marlins president, Larry Beinfest, joins us now. Uh, Larry, first first off, after having watched the, uh, the promo for the road trip, what do you hear about weather in Philadelphia and New York? Have you guys been in contact with those ball clubs? Not yet. I mean, we're uh, we're watching Irene. It looks like it's going to follow us right up the coast. But um, I'm sure we'll hear from the Phillies tomorrow, and and uh, they'll have things under control. But let's hope. Let's hope that we can uh, play a lot of games in HD. All right. We've got plenty of uh, baseball-related questions. But just to put a cap on the new ballpark talk, from player development and from the uh, baseball side of the operations, what will the new ballpark mean to you and to the team on the field? No rain delays. No rain delays is, are huge, and just starting on time and knowing we can warm up the pitcher and not have to worry about the elements. But I think it'll be a game changer in so many ways. Just the intimacy of the ballpark, obviously, the fans, just a completely different feel than we have here at Sun Life. So um, I think the guys will be energized. I think our fans will love it. I think it's uh, really a new beginning in a lot of ways for the team, and I know the guys will be excited uh, six months from now. Baden Hop gets a strike on Paul Yanish. The pitchers do up next in the top of the order, Brandon Phillips. In the seventh, the three nothing Reds lead. We had lots of emails last night about a variety of topics. And I guess with you, we'll start with your injured players. Let's start with Josh Johnson. Where is Josh at this point? And do you expect to see him back on a mound before the season's up? Well, again, I've been with you guys a couple times during uh, his hiatus, uh, JJ, but he's throwing. He's throwing 90, 120 feet. He's not back up on the mound yet, but hopefully that'll happen soon. And we've talked about it. I, ideally, we'd like to get him in games, whether it's minor league games or major league games. Just get him on the mound, get him back in, in a competitive environment, and make sure that he feels okay so we head into the offseason knowing exactly where he is. Larry, is it a concern to this point that he's not back up on a mound yet? Um, I think it's a concern, Tommy, when this thing happened. Yeah. And J.J.'s such a hard worker and a great kid, and he's in great condition. So the frustrating part of this is, well, he's got a little shoulder thing. He's going to get a shot at me back in a couple of weeks. Well, that was almost four months ago, and it's uh, it's been a big loss for us. But, you know, he had the hiccup, and, and then he had to restart again. And, and uh, let's hope that it's that it, that it, he can follow through now on the rest of the progression and get on the mound and, and hopefully get in some games. Question number two, your other all-star, Hanley Ramirez. Hanley is uh, doing well. Um, he was scheduled to take BP today with the doubleheader. I didn't get the report on how the BP went, but uh, it may not be long. We're hopeful it won't be long that he can start a, a rehab assignment, hopefully this weekend, and and then see him active on the road trip. That is our hope at this point. I'll tell you what, Jupiter's had a lot of uh, nice players playing some of their games. Yeah, they have. They have, <laughs> um, which isn't a great thing. No, it's I mean, not we'd a love good to have thing. our own prospects <laughs> playing, but they've had some rehab guys and and uh, it is convenient, obviously, being an hour from the ballpark to be able to send guys up there and shuttle them back and forth. And we would not like to do it as often as we've done it this season, but that's the way it goes. And how's Chris Coughlin doing? He's in AAA. He's playing. And, um, you know, he missed quite a bit of time. So he needs to, to get his legs under him and get a swing back and, and be in competition. And then we'll, and we'll see from there. But, again, that was, a, that was almost a two-month deal, I think, mm -hmm. or a six-week deal. And. That's tough in the middle of the season to, and you know, Tommy, to, to stop and then start again. Oh, yeah. Is he playing center field? Playing center field, and, okay. um, and he's doing okay down there. So, again, he's just getting going off the DL, and it may take him a little while to get going. Brandon Phillips. It's a chopper foul. Coming back from Tommy John surgery is tough for a pitcher. For a catcher, it's really a, a unique challenge. Where's John Baker in his rehab from Tommy John? Well, he's swinging the bat pain-free, and he's throwing pain-free. The arm strength has a little, been a little slow coming back, but it may not be long where he's before he's ready to go out on rehab as well. We're just waiting for the arm strength now and, and getting whatever pain he had out of there. And it's it's been a long road road for him. Mm -hmm. And uh, position players generally come back, you know, quicker than pitchers. But in this case, it's a catcher, and there's obviously a lot of torque and and a lot going on when a catcher, you know, gets up from behind the plate and it's just taking Baker a little bit longer. And, and when you get him out playing, you want him catching, not just going out to DH. Yeah, I, I, no doubt about it. I mean, we want a complete player, and, mm -hmm. and uh, he just needs to get the arm strength back. I think we've kind of gotten through the, the pain part of it, 
and maybe the hiccups that are associated with the Tommy John and now it's just the arm strength needs to come back. Phillips with a count of one and two. Baden Hop misses outside. And two and two. I, I see where Scott Cousins is back and finally playing after a, a long time with the uh, back ailment. You've done your homework, Rich. I mean, I, I have a tough time keeping up on our DL sometimes, <laughs> but he's back as well. And and um, that was a little bit more severe than we thought. Also at the time when he went on the DL, we said, "Yeah, hey, we'll get Cuz back." And it's been a couple months for that, but he's back playing, and we'll, and we'll see about his readiness for September. All right. When we get back, we got some more questions for you about guys not on the DL, but guys on the field. Three nothing. Reds on top. next year now don't worry about the plastic back there that's just the construction look you'll see your view in a second it is by far the most spacious of the eight broadcast booth here at the new ballpark and Tommy if Rich sends you the wrong way one night he pushes Hutton's buttons you can send him all the way to the other side you'll be separated by this nice thick wall as for your view it's going to be a spectacular one both of the field and of downtown Miami and none of that Frank <laughs> none of that wet none stuff. of that it's raining bottom of the seventh Bronson Arroyo breaking ball misses up. As Larry said, first thing out of his mouth, no rain delays next year. <laughs> no rain delays next year. And, hopefully uh, no rain A little pre-Irene action, I guess, here. But hopefully we can play through. Uh-oh. Mike Stan left field. That ball's deep. That ball is off the wall. Stanton thought it was out. He's trotting, and he just gets to second. Wow. Mike thought he had hit it out. I don't know if the wind held it or he just misjudged it. That's amazing because I think we all thought he hit it out. He hit it on the end of the bat, but he has to know that feel. He knows what it feels like. He almost hit a home run San Diego. He broke his bat, but he launched it, but it wasn't far enough, and he had his head down. He was in his home run trot. Right there, he thinks it's out. Well, he's fortunate. Yeah, he is. He had that, that fighting look, too, when he saw the throw coming in. He's fortunate. So stands at second. Here comes Dobbs. The Marlins have their fifth hit against Arroyo, who misses outside. Gabby Sanchez follows Greg Dobbs. Larry Beinfest is with us. This guy has exceeded a lot of expectations. He has really flourished this year in a variety of roles Greg Dobbs. Oh no question he's one of the positives and you know this has been disappointing Rich and Tommy the the way we've kind of swooned here of late but you know you look at the guy at second base and his power and he just missed that one in the year he's had as a rookie at 21 years old and well not a rookie but a 21 year old and Dobbs the way he's filled in and Bonnie the way he's improved his overall game this year and Infante. you just see and Infante at second his defense there's been so many positives and then you know, we just had these patches where we've just almost completely shut down and, and had a tough time, and this is where we are now. But um, you see a lot of positives on the field, and and we need to to remember that as we start to wane down in this season and, and head toward next. Is there's a lot of good things still to, happening with this ball club. 
Larry, Larry, takes inside. We were talking about one of those positives uh, in between innings. And Rich and I have brought the conversation up a lot during games. From what you've seen in Bonifacio, wherever position it is, do you see him as an everyday player? I don't. No question, Tommy. I mean, it's always been the game-changing speed. We're just waiting for the on-base to match up with the speed, and he's done a great job trying to bunt, keep the ball on the ground. Now he's a home run hitter <laughs> that we saw yesterday. He's implementing that into his game, but um, he's done a terrific job. And and you know, it, all guys come at different pace. And for Bonnie, I think he's found comfort now in the big leagues and. And he's such a hard worker and such an up guy, and absolutely, he did. I think he's made a place for himself in the lineup. Man, what a night for Brandon Phillips, who's been putting on a clinic, diving to his right, diving to his left. He'll tweet about that one. Gold glove on display tonight. Well, he went the ends other way. up at third. Yeah, he went the other way to Rob Logan Morrison, and he goes to his left to pick one off the bat of Greg Dobbs. Speaking of Logan Morrison. Lomo back in the lineup. He homers, gets a couple of hits. He has scorched the ball tonight. He's been robbed uh, two or three times of hits. Um, talk about his uh, his ten days down in, in AAA. Did he respond the way that you guys were hoping? Yes. I mean, Logan's a good player. He's going to be a good player for a long time. We just wanted to get him down, and we've talked about it to work on all aspects of being a major leaguer. I'm not really going to go into more specifics than that. And there's been a Big deal made about it, but you know, guys have hiccups in their career. Logan, Logan's a big part of this team. He's going to be a big part of this team, and uh, we think he's a terrific player. He needed to, to go down, work on some things, and he's back. And uh, he made his presence known in, in game one, and I'm sure it's not the last time we'll hear from him. He's uh, he's a very good young player. We had lots of questions on email Tuesdays and even outside uh, the games about when the Marlins look towards next year what areas will they focus on and we speculate it's our job it's what we do left handed starting pitcher how do you get one how important is it in this division well, I think starting pitching period needs to improve and I'm not going to name names or anything but we need to do a better job I mean we've relied a lot on our bullpen which is not a good formula you'd like to have balance in the rotation maybe to neutralize some of the bats here in the east but I'm just looking for five good pitchers that can go out there and give you seven innings and that's our that's our organizational goal and there's some guys that have been getting an opportunity this year maybe they haven't taken advantage of it and we've had to deal with some injury just like a lot of ball clubs but it, it, it really starts there with the pitching and, and it sets the tone and we, you know I know you guys have been flashing the stats about you know the the first inning runs and the runs we give up early in the game and that just sets the tone for the game you're always on your heels you're always trying to come back you always feel the pressure of having to come back we, we can't have that happen we need to set the tone early with our starting pitching and then let our offense go to work. Gabby trying to drive in this run and he pops it into center not deep enough Stubbs will make the catch Stanton will bluff and the throw comes home on a hop and the Marlins don't deliver it so it's up to Brian Peterson now with two outs Peterson. Oh, for one, has been hit by a pitch. And, and Larry, we talked about some of the positives. I think Brian Peterson has to be one of those. Yeah, uh, you know, he struggled in some earlier opportunities. I think we put him into a tough spot last year when he was uh, exclusively pinch hitting, and that's very hard for any young player. But he's a young, strong guy. He runs well. He's a good defender. Um, and, and to his credit, he went to AAA. This is a guy who went to AAA on a mission. He was sent down early in spring training. He was disappointed, and he really went to work at it and, and earned his way back. And um, he's been a spark for us and done a really good job. He plays all three outfield positions uh, very well, and, and he's handled himself very well, and that's important to a young player. He's shown that he can pinch hit and play well as, in a reserve role. Young players don't always do that. No, no question. He struggled doing that when, the, when he first came up. But, again, Petey went down and, and really worked hard on his game and, uh, and earned his way back. I think at the time we brought him up, he was hitting 340, something like 351. that. 351. 351, okay. We'll take it. And, uh, and he's really done a good job and, and uh, again, a spark for us in a, in a lot of respects. You expect an active trade market, free agent market, with the Marlins or other teams? Well, I think we're always active. I think that there's obviously some changes that we'd like to make to this team, and we're still formulating those and working on the offseason plan because really this season is almost over, and we're already starting that program to get ready for next. And, um, yeah, I think we will be active. I think we, we always try to be active, and, and you know, we want to be good as we head into the new ballpark. I think, it's, I think it's very, very important, and we need to make some improvements to this team. 
How's, how's the progression been? Early on, he had an injury, and I believe right now he's he got a little hamstring. How's the progression been for Matt Dominguez? Yeah, he's just about ready to come back from a hamstring that's derailed him for a couple weeks. But he's hitting 260. Again, the defense is the defense. It's 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 major league ready and, and well above average. And you know, he's hitting 260. He's showing a little bit of power. It's coming. It's coming a little bit slow. Um, again, all guys come at a, at a different pace, Tommy, and we still think very highly of Matt. Whether he's ready or not to, to play in the new ballpark, we'll see. Um, we're still determining whether we'll see him here in September. That's something we'll talk about here in the next 10 days and, and figure that out, and, and then we'll go from there. But this is a, a, a good young talent, and as soon as the bat's ready, he'll be here because he can really play third base. Not everybody uh, is it as accelerated as a Freddie Freeman or a Mike Stanton at 21 in the big leagues. Well, I've, you know, we've we've been blessed here. We saw Miguel Cabrera blow through the system and Dontre <laughs> Willis, who's obviously in the other dugout, blow through the system and, and Mike Stanton blow through the system and Logan Morrison came quickly. But, it, it, you know, they all come at a different rate. And these are very special guys, and I think Matt fits in that category, but he's He's just developing offensively, and that's fine. Had a chance to talk to uh, Dontrell? I missed him. I missed him yesterday. I saw him out. He was going to do some running, and I was talking to Jack about uh, about bringing Lomo back, actually. And um, and then with the doubleheader today, I got a little bit off kilter. But um, definitely one of our favorites. Um, what a, what magic he brought to the ballpark here. And uh, he'll always be a favorite here in South Florida. Brian Peterson battling Bronson Arroyo. And Arroyo... Is going to keep his shutout. Larry, thanks for the visit. Good luck the rest of the way. Well, I'm sure we'll check in with you once we get to September. All right, guys, have a good flight tonight. Great, thanks, Larry. Awesome. Three nothing, Reds. Vía SAP y es presentado por KFC. En el segundo partido. Old fashioned double header. Nice. How do you say it? Partido doble? There's different doble ways. Juego. Doble, doble juego, juego, doble jornada, doble cartelera. I like the doble juego. Doble, yeah, okay. doble is the common denominator, obviously. Hey, right. Remember, I mentioned to you guys we're going to win two. Remember that? I won one already, so we're working on this one. Yeah, aquí un Gotta love the hopper, pitcher. a comebacker, and yeah, Baden Hop flips the first. Baden Hop working on the uh, Reds here in the top of the eighth. He's retired all four that he's faced after Chris Volstad went the first six innings. Hey, Cookie. Yes, sir. Bronson Arroyo is is one of those <clears throat> guys. He he's not overpowering, but you never can get a good swing against him. It looks like. Well, I don't think you get two same speeds out of him. You know, he kills us at fastball, he cuts it. He's got a good sinker, throws the ball up in on him. We've got the slow curve ball and the changeup. And, you know, he's been successful doing that. He doesn't go ahead and try to fire, you know, balls uh, 95, 96 mile an hour. He just uses a good control and command of the strike zone. And I think that's uh, what, uh, what pitching is all about. Well, he's certainly doing it here tonight. 
Votto wow. screams that one by Dobbs. Patazo de gira izquierdo. Left field has been Votto's playground today. A, a homer in the first game to left, a two run shot, a solo shot to left in the third inning of the nightcap. It's amazing power that he has to left field, isn't it? I, I never realized that he had that much power towards the uh, opposite field. He's an impressive hitter. He sure is. No question. A proud Canadian is Joey Votto. All right, guys, you've survived so far. <laughs> Cookie, we're going to hold you to your word of getting two. All right. All right. I'm working on it. OK. All right. All right. Here's, <laughs> here's Jay Bruce. Have a safe trip, guys, when you uh, go to Philly and New York. OK. Thank OK. You. Thanks. All right, guys. Baden Hop runs that one outside to Bruce. Votto's hit for the Reds. He is just their sixth of the ball game. One and one. Nick Massett and Roldis Chapman. Two and one. Marlins have a doubleheader scheduled Monday in New York. Same bat time, four o'clock for the first game. Slow tapper. Votto had to hesitate. They get the out at second. Gabby smartly comes off the bag and smothers the throw. Yeah, and the reason that Omar Infante was able to, to get the lead runner, Joey Votto, is because he hesitated. Commemorate the team's history as the Florida Marlins. You can select the top memories in the team's 19 seasons. Go to Marlins.com, cast your vote for the top memory, and then be at Marlins Closing Day on September 28th when the winning memory will be revealed. Go to Marlins.com and vote today. What's your favorite Marlins memory? Yeah. Talked about it earlier. The uh, Edgar Renteria hit. They become the first wild card team to win a world championship. This place was electric. Did you at that point think that this club would still be playing in this facility? No, because uh, it, it always seemed like uh, something could get done and a ballpark would have been built soon. Oh, well, many tried. Many tried, and Jeffrey Loria has uh, come through. And the city of Miami, and the county. It's a collective deal. And to coin a few terms, I think I've heard Claude Delorme use this. The guys on the construction, the two gentlemen that Craig talked to, when people go to that new ballpark, they will have a wow moment. Of course, in talking to Larry Beinfest, the challenge for the Marlins is to provide the wow moment the wow moment when you walk in the stadium and a wow moment on the field on the field. Yeah, that's Larry's job. There, there's one of those moments right there when you sit down in your seat you can check that out. And the other thing if you if you have a seat let's say in in right field you can walk around the promenade and still get a chance to check that view out. I think a lot of people in South Florida have obviously moved here from other places and have seen games in real ballparks. Facilities that were built just for baseball. But if you haven't, if this is the only place where you've seen a Major League Baseball game, then you're obviously in for a real treat. Because this facility obviously was built for football. Baseball was an afterthought. It kind of. Uh, Knock down some uh, the stands and 
left field the football bleachers on the east side. Runner goes Hayes a quick snap throw beautiful. Oh it just came out on the snow cone tag. Infante almost picked it and finished the tag. It's a good throw. Good throw. It's a little short on the hop. Uh, it's it's a tough. I mean, they're giving uh, Omar Infante an error. This is a tough error. Got to finish the play. He's just trying to finish it and get it out of the glove. I don't think that you can give Infante an error. You can't give Infante an error. No, he's, he's been given an error. Caught stealing E4. There's no way. I mean, it's a short hop pick. It's in the webbing of his glove. It's a snow cone job. The runner, probably because he had contact with the runner, is why he wasn't able to hang on. Absolutely. That's ridiculous. Change that. I'm not putting E4 down. Stadium. Not too many people will be too sad to say goodbye to Sun Life, uh, at least the baseball players. But for those who won championships here, this will be forever a special place like Cincinnati's Dontrell Willis. I love it. You do I love best. it. I love it. It's the house that Conine built. And, uh, you know, I, I like to say, you know, the house that Conine built, and uh, we, we just put down some, you know, fixtures for him, you know, so. But uh, I, I love the stadium. Every year they change the name, you know, Joe Robbie, yeah. Sun Life. <laughs> I love playing down there, like I said, you know, no matter if it's 1,000 or 40,000, you know, uh, hearing the Let's Go Mets uh, chance with the <laughs> Let's Go Marlins uh, chance mixed in. You know, I, I loved all of it, and I definitely enjoyed it, and I, I wouldn't change it for the world. Thank you. Uh, Don Trell reflecting on some great moments. He was part of a lot of them here in this stadium, and his uh, records speak for themselves here. He's one of the all-time uh, winning pitchers in this ballpark. And you look at uh, a lot of his numbers and the innings pitched and wins in this stadium. Uh, shutouts, he's tied with A.J. Burnett. So he had uh, really a, a launching pad here to his major league career and the world championship right here at Sun Life. That's for sure. And it's great to see him back after his struggles with the Tigers, with the uh, Giants organization, with the uh, Diamondbacks. And finally, it has clicked again with the Reds. Red Hayes hooks one foul. Bronson Arroyo has been magnificent tonight. As Cookie Rojas put it, he never gives you the same speed, the same arm angle, the same look. A five-hit shutout for the Florida native. Mike Cameron is on deck. We've got Emilio Bonifacio following. A couple of opportunities for Brett Hayes to get a little action with the uh, doubleheader Monday in New York. There's Jose Seda.
Hayes got jammed and Arroyo catches the pop up. So Arroyo pitching strong here into the eighth. Reminder you can follow us, sort of, at FS Marlins on Twitter. We're not tweeting all the time. We're not uh, necessarily reading during the game. That's tough to do. But on email Tuesdays and Twitter Tuesdays, we do. And from the road trip, my technophobe pal, Tommy Hutton, always tweeting photos, random thoughts, observations. Tweeted a nice photo of the. Uh the tin fish down in San Diego just before we had fish tacos. It's one of your best uh, tweets of the year. Brandon Phillips has made every play possible, so why not just run down a pop up in fair territory down the right field line? Cameron tweeted, is out. Tweeted a photo of the USS Midway. Right now, Bronson Arroyo is at 106 pitches, but uh, cruising along. Bonifacio, look at that! Slugs it into shallow left. That it. <laughs> We've seen Bonifacio try that a lot. That's one of the few times where he's actually been able to do it. And you know what, Tommy? That's. That's so artistic. That's going to be our Gunther Volkswagen drive of the game. And I think the the more he he has opportunities and tries things like this, the more sex, success he's going to have. If he pops that over the third baseman, said he has a double. <laughs> if it's more toward the line, he was thinking to. Now Infante, Reds bullpen is ready if needed. So you got Morrison and Stanton after Infante. Two hits in this one for Infante. Kind In of a unique game that Arroyo has going. He has just one strikeout, but he hasn't walked anybody. No, and, and there haven't been a lot of balls hit hard. And he's helped himself. That's why he has a gold glove. Our last Fort reports from the new ballpark when we return. They have the championship and the Hall of Fame suites where they sell individual seats within that suite. You can enjoy all the amenities inside, the food and drink, then come outside, sit in these first three rows of seats, enjoy the beautiful view of downtown Miami and the ball game. And when the roof is closed, the temperature out here will be 75 degrees on average. Now let's get back to Sun Life Stadium and the ball game. 75 degrees, no rain. Amenities. Jose Seda. 3-0 Reds. There's Jose Seda. 
You know, <laughs> the first game save was so tenuous. Edward Mojica started the inning. This is in the uh, the ninth inning. The Marlins at that time were up six to three. Edward Mojica started the inning. He gave up a two run homer and then a walk. Steve Ciszek came in and once Ciszek came in Jose Seda got up in the bullpen. So it was like all hands on deck. Seda goes to work tries to keep it at three nothing. Francisco Cordero is available. Yeah it's interesting I was I was just looking Bronson Arroyo in his career has three shutouts. Stanton a long run towards the wall reaches. Does he hold on. Oh goodness. He does. Mike Stanton. Oh wow. A crash landing. And the former wide receiver corner. Who was offered a full ride to USC. Goes straight on into the wall. Takes on the wall. And makes the catch. Uh, that's a big man flipping over the wall, but hanging on to the baseball. That's a great play, great concentration by Mike Stanton. Look at that in the webbing, braces himself, can't stop 250 pounds. And boy, on the back, it's just good that he feels okay and got up. Oof. Wow. That's uh, 6'5, 250 pounds of. Right fielder going over that wall. That's a heck of a play. Ryan Hannigan, Reds catcher. So Cordero is up. Marlins will have Morrison, Stanton, Dobbs, and Gabby Sanchez if it gets that far. Good slider by Jose Seda. I think he's starting to get a little more comfortable. The the more he's used. I think one of the biggest challenges for Seda is just keeping weight off. And when he came and joined the organization, that was one of the concerns. And it has been since he's been in the organization. Yeah, I think it's something he's going to always have to battle. <laughs> Throws a fastball by Hannigan. So he's got two outs here in the ninth. And then up comes Janish. And it's interesting you would think well that's probably harder to battle in the minor leagues. But it's actually harder to battle that, that weight problem at the major league level. Because of the meal money because of the nice uh, clubhouses that have uh, wonderful meals before and after games. Really have to watch what you what you're going to eat. And then keep yourself in shape and how much of it you eat. Yeah. I mean it's it's good food and it's nutritious stuff but if you eat too much of it. Off the end of the bat has some nasty English to it. Gabby Sanchez steps on the bag. So it looks like Cordero is coming in. And the Marlins need three runs.
Maroney, South Florida, when you need a car, truck, or van, who are you going to call? 1877 Maroney. I'm by Checkers. Little place. Big taste. Before Irene swings by and dumps a lot of water on South Florida, the Marlins and the Reds playing a doubleheader today. The Fish won the first. They kept this guy in the bullpen. Marlins won 6-5, to five, but Francisco Cordero arrives now and tries to shut the door and finish what Bronson Arroyo started. Arroyo, eight innings, six hits. Obviously no runs and no walks, and as Tommy pointed out, just a strikeout. Kind of interesting. You look at uh, Bronson Arroyo's career, closing in on 275 career starts. That's six years of over 200 innings. Yet in his career, just 11 complete games and only three shutouts. Morrison robbed of a hit, a screaming one hopper that Brandon Phillips dove to his right on. Picked off the outfield grass. Cordero bends one in for a strike. It's 0 2. Morrison's first day back since coming up from Triple A. How did he start his day? The biz. Towards like cold hard blast. Yeah, it's good to see second A B. Remember first A B hit a hard shot to first base, and this one was a hard shot into that tunnel in right field. Slow roller out to short. Yanish stays down on it and throws him out. So here's Mike Stanton now. Marlins headed to Philadelphia, scheduled for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Wet stuff at this point. The cone of probability, is that right, huh? Cone of probability. Cone yeah. of probability has rain in Philadelphia on Sunday, which could. Uh, Land in New York, and probably. If you, and if you don't talk Monday. about that a lot, it's the cone of silence. <laughs> Stanton swings and misses, and it's 0 2. Stanton doubled in the seventh on a ball he thought he hit out and literally put his head down and trotted around first, only to glance up in horror as the uh, throw was coming into second and he just got in for a double. That was when that rain, that swirling wind and rain had just come into the ballpark. And I think that may have had something to do with uh, holding that ball up because he knows his swing as well as anybody. He did hit it off the end of the bat, but he has the power to hit one off the end of the bat and hit it out. Watch and this. he certainly thought it was out. Head down. Oh, whoops. Ground ball. Cairo to his left. In the dirt, and Votto can't pick it. So Miguel Cairo will get an error. They, they have not taken away that uh, error from Omar and Fonte. They are still charging in Fonte with an error on that uh, tag play at second base. Stanton at first. Here comes Dobbs. You've got Gabby to follow. So E5 there. Dobbs a, a key hit in the first game the two run double gave the Marlins a 6 3 cushion they needed every one of those runs in the ninth uh, that one just missed not sure what that was or where it went it missed badly. Hannigan wanted no part of it. And then he almost plays the carom. He's coming up thinking about throwing. <laughs> nice. 
the Toyota Fox tracks illustrating that it actually hit the plate. There's the changeup. Ball and a strike. See what he gets one and one. Fastball came back, caught the plate. One and two. Same pitch. Missed in. Boy, three, pitch three, just clipped the zone. Four was inside. Kind of gives you an idea of where he's pitching uh, Greg Dobbs, too. Angel Hernandez has had a nice night behind the plate. Two, two. Dobbs lifts it down the left field line. It's tailing and it's in there for a base hit. And extra bases. Marlins are on the board. Dobbs has his second RBI double of the day. Each game, Greg Dobbs has saved the best for the last. He's gotten that double, drove in two runs with his double in the first game. Picks up an RBI. Double in the first game was down the right field line. This one he slices just a perfect spot down that left field line and races into second base with a 17th double. Tommy, he's a professional hitter. And what it does now is it will twice, if nothing happens at second base, bring the tying run to the plate. Gabby Sanchez, Brian Peterson's on deck. Gabby went after a, a high fastball. That's going to be back in the seats. So it's 0 and 1. Buries that one in the dirt. Cordero worked a 1 2 3 ninth last night to pick up save number 27. One ball, one strike. Marlins down two, one out in the ninth. Now it's two and one. Gabby has the ability, but his last home run was back on July 22nd. Line drive, base hit over the head of Cairo. Here comes Dobbs. He will score. It's 3-2. And here comes Peterson. Well, he has the ability to do a lot of things. Hit home runs, drive in runs, and the Marlins trying to do a little bit what the Reds did last night. Jump on the bullpen. That's a good swing by Gabby Sanchez. Dobbs comes in to score, and it is a one-run game. Fred Lewis in left field made a good play to get to that ball and then come up and throw to second base and keep Gabby at first base. Now you've got Peterson. First pitch swinging. He was trying to win it with one swing and it's 0 and 1 and the Marlins have some options as pinch hitters from this point forward and one of them maybe the hottest is on deck and that is Jose Lopez.
Cordero buries that one in the dirt. Right now, it looks like Cordero's having a little trouble with that split. He uses his first changeup. Peterson has just one career homer. Outfields deep, 1 1 in the dirt. 21 pitches for Cordero. He got Morrison to bounce out to open the inning. Remember Cairo on a ball to his left through low to first, and Stanton reached on the air. And Dusty Baker hoping that his closer can bring it home. And you got to know that somewhere Bronson Arroyo is on the edge of his seat because this is his ball game to win. He went eight shutout innings. And really didn't get in much trouble at all. 2 1. Two and two. Peterson an 0 for two night. He struck out in a pinch hitting appearance in the first game. Obviously Cordero is looking for a ground ball. Jack McKeon's looking for some heroics. Fly ball left field. Lewis back at the wall reaches up and makes the catch. Wow right at Charlie Huff. Fred Lewis stretched as far as he could and he brought it in. Yeah I think that ball carried a little more than Lewis thought because he kind of went back on it casually waiting to, to grab it right about here. Then it started to carry. He had to get to the base of the wall and then make a little leap right at the end. But well struck by Peterson. But Lewis right there. So here is Lopez. Lopez earlier today hit a two run homer to left. He takes a big swing and a miss. He had an outstanding road trip in Colorado. In San Diego. Those are his season totals, including his time with the Rockies and his first time up with a fish. And in case you missed it, here's a look at game one. This was a rocket. High fastball got on his toes and just crushed it. And he swings at a ball in the dirt and it's one and two. And that's the the problem you've got with Cordero. If you get too aggressive on the fastball, it'll snap one off on you. Let's see what he's got one and two. A comebacker and the Reds get the game. They win the series. They get a doubleheader split. Cincinnati comes to South Florida takes two of three from the fish. The Marlins rally but come up a run short. Cordero nails down his second save.